Good morning. Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us. And all I got to say this morning is we are so blessed to be here to be able to sing some songs. Ready, guys? Yep. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I Wonder working power. 
Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Fire fall, revival fire. 
passion and presence, bring down your burning desire. Revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Fall upon us here with the power of your spirit. Father, let revival fire fall. Revival fire
night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. My announcements. If you have uh, prayer concerns, feel free to put them in the comments or text me or just let me know as you're going by. Uh, our usual offering baskets are in the back. I noticed they're switched, which threw me for a second um, at different locations, but just notice that. And then you can mail them in um, to the to various different churches. Are there? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yesterday, uh, we got our bids on the uh, house and we sold it for four top hours. Yeah. So, we the Kenny body. That's a great celebration. Excellent. Yeah, it was great. It's quite to be done with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we go to God and worship. Praise, O holy God. We remember the multitude of blessings that you have given us. We're mindful of the ways in which you have lifted us up when we have fallen low. Give us confidence in your presence so that we may go into your world ready to witness to your love through our works and deeds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. There's a wideness in God's mercy 
in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. There is plentiful redemption existed in in the past, the place that I thought was built to last, turns out to be an aching wound from the way I've gained and assumed. So, Lord, water, fall, let tears be my call. Lord, don't hold back, take it all, take it all. In all relations now and past, breathe life that's meant to last. May the consequences of the then and now heal beneath the cell of your know-how. And love become the remedy, the power of God that sets us free. Because God's grace is not wisdom tool, a dying art, a gesture's tool. It comes as tender to the flame, spirited passion of the holy name. I have to still and just rest in it. Agree to the places of your benefit. And remember the cause to which I claim. Level the bricks and align them again. To befriend the rich and the poor. So comfort is a luxury no more. But the constant of kingdom living. And the inspiration of all giving. We can't hold up this world on our own. Take it all. We can't hold up this world on our own. own. Take it all. Take it all. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Here are these words from the 20th chapter of Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When, when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle at the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same thing. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, 
you also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then go to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual day's wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last workers only work for only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no harm, no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give the last the same as I give you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. The text for the Hebrew scriptures today that I didn't read uh, comes to us from the Exodus story of the manna, of God providing manna in the wilderness. It actually helps us see, get a little, provides us a better understanding and a lens to interpret our parable today that's called the laborer in the vineyard. Out in the wilderness with Israel, God is creating a new people who will embody an alternative to the ways of Egypt, the ways of domination and suppression, rich and poor, powerful and powerless. Central to the formation of that people is the gift of manna. The manna is nothing fancy or luxurious. It's basic sustenance. It is daily bread. The key thing is the manna is a gift that cannot be hoarded. Indeed, when people try to gather more than their share, the extra manna becomes worm-ridden and foul. With manna, everyone has plenty. Everyone has enough, but no one has too much. The leaders and the servants receive the same amount. The people who work all day and the people who have very little to do receive the same amount. The able and the disabled receive the same amount. Enough, but not too much. And it is all a gift, a gift from God. The story becomes an embodiment of the Lord's, supper, the Lord's prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. It is reenacted by Jesus in multiple places, particularly in the wilderness when he feeds thousands of people with a few loaves and a couple of fish. And everyone has enough, and no one has too much. The story of manna in the wilderness helps us see what's going on with the laborers in the vineyard. Jesus is also seeking to create a new people, a new order. He's telling a parable to the disciples as they struggle to understand the reign of God in the old framework of the world. That is, rich and poor, superior and inferior. Through the parable, Jesus seeks to interrupt the old assumptions and create a new possibility of something new. Through the, this odd parable, this unsettling parable, he both envisions a new order of God, the church and the kingdom of God, and unmasks the deadly spirits of the old order, the world and the Roman Empire. <clears throat> In the parable, Jesus holds before the disciples a new reality, what the church could be, and offers a vision of an alternative household of God's empire, the kingdom of God. In this household, as in the wilderness, everyone receives the necessary daily bread, which undermines the old distinctions and competition with the preoccupation that the disciples have and preoccupies us so much. New Testament scholar at Philip Seminary in Tulsa, Warren Carter, writes about this odd and surprising payment to the workers. Instead of maintaining differentiation among the laborers based on performance, Instead of reinforcing superiority of some at the expense of the, the rest, the householder has evened out the distinctions and treats them in solidarity as our equals. Instead of using wages to reinforce the distinctions, he uses them to express equality and solidarity. And so we see in this parable, it envisions an alternative social order, just as God envisioned and, cre envisioned and created a similar alternative order out in the wilderness. The parable is painfully unmasks assumptions that we have and shaped our lives to such an extent that we can't even imagine alternatives. It unmasks an order that often encourages us, us to pray, give me my daily bread. My. 
rather than what it really says, give us our daily bread. The householder's odd method of payment, in which those who work longest must wait and watch everyone else receive the same as they, exposes this lie. Those who work all day complain, bringing to mind the grumbling of Israel in the wilderness. And we grumble too, don't we? And say it's not fair. We identify with the folks who worked all day. The whole thing seems incredibly unfair. I mean, who wouldn't feel resentful after working all day and seeing someone else get the same amount of money for the work of just an hour? And that's the problem with grace right there. It's not fair. And that's why we struggle to understand grace. We set up so much of our lives in the expectations that the world is, or at least should be, fair. I mean, if people keep coming at the right at the end of the day and get the same amount as everyone else, what else can we count on? Until, that is, we imagine that we're not the folks working all day, but we are the ones that weren't called to work, didn't get picked for the team, we are left waiting all day, hoping to earn a day's wage, to feed our family just one more day. It's not our fault, it's just the way the day played out. It same goes in life. Lots of folks play by the rules and don't get ahead. Others seem to totally shred the rules and they prosper. The world isn't fair. When you're down and out, when you're at the bottom, when you're the one the world has been, not been fair to, or you're the one who screwed up and hurt yourself or someone else, then suddenly grace matters even more. Grace, that is, is for people who aren't okay and don't have it all together. What we learn from this parable is that the landowner begins by giving everyone in the story work. Each of us, each of the laborers is unemployed, and each is given work to do with the promise of pay. They all begin in the same situation, the same place, but easily forget by the end of the day where they started. Their energy goes not to the fact that they have work and are being paid, but to the inequity they see. Envy becomes more important than what they have received. Are you envious because I am generous? asks the landowner. In the Greek it reads, is your eye evil because I am good? This accusation of jealousy pits the claims of justice against claims of grace. God's generosity here violates our sense of right and wrong, our sense of how things would be if we ran the world. Our ideas of right and wrong and what's just and unjust are not necessarily God's <coughs> ideas. And that's a very good thing. That's good news. This is not a story of fairness. This is a story of generosity. And we all should be relieved. How would we like it if God dealt with us fairly? We're reminded by this parable that the tables are turned. When we look for equity and we're surprised by generosity in God's kingdom, this parable reminds us that God is a lousy bookkeeper and invites us to transform our pride, envy, and hardness into joy by admiring and celebrating God's generosity. It invites us to turn from holding grudges because things didn't go our way to letting go of the stuff of our lives that keeps us from being joy-filled and grateful people. Nearly all of the readings of this parable throughout Christian tradition have understood this allegory as allegorical, where the owner is God and the denarius, denarius the money, represents salvation. In contrast, these appeals for justice, the parable insists that salvation comes only by grace. Moreover, these readers typically highlight that those who are called last do so without any promise of payment at all. These laborers then model faith. They trust completely in the grace of God, who is the owner of the vineyard. Despite the dominance of Christian metaphorical readings of this text, some readers wonder whether the parable is focused not on the dynamics of salvation, but on social and economic conflicts in the ancient world. Jesus may have been speaking about real day laborers and the economic terrors of their lives. Amy Jill Levine is one of those who question these historical interpretations in the book Short Stories for Jesus. She says that Jesus was more interested in how we love our neighbor than how we get to heaven. She asks an intriguing question. Might we rather see this parable about real workers in real marketplace and are real landowners who hire those workers? Our reaction is, no way. But wasn't Jesus the kind of guy who wanted everyone to have enough? If the guys who were hired late through no fault of their own only got one twelfth of a day's labor, 
their family would starve. This is the same Jesus who told a rich man to sell everything that he had, who directed party hosts to invite them, who couldn't invite them back, who spoke of lending lenders forgiving massive financial debts, who included despised and untouchable people in his close circle, who visited Zacchaeus and left him so staggered that he gave his hard-earned money back with no interest to those who he'd earned it from. Shares of stock in a company run by Jesus would plummet in value. But he is our leader. We follow him, right? Could we, his followers, lead like him in this very different way? Jesus was like a child who can't stop asking questions. Like a child who sees a homeless person by the road and asks, Mommy, can't he live at our house? Maybe we can't pull off the vineyard wage maneuver or to invite a homeless person to live with us. But is there a way to lean in that direction? To engage in something dynamic, dramatic, and veer a bit more towards Jesus than business as usual? Jesus asks leaders not merely to obey the law, or even to be kind, but to be graciously different. It reminds me of a bit of a story about a high school graduation that was a bit different. I heard it from a Lutheran pastor named Philip Martin. He says... There were no valedictorians or salutatorians, no student speeches at all at this graduation. The principal of R.J. Rennell High School in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, was a man by the name of Bob Denton. He had served as principal for 30 years. Relatively early on his tenure, he had done away with any of the accolades at graduation. No one was allowed to wear sashes for such and such honor, society, and any tassels or badges or anything else that might make them stand out above anyone else. All the graduates wore identical white gowns so that if you were in the audience and you were looking at one big group of equals, there is no way that you could tell class rank or athletic ability or how active anyone was in extracurricular activities. Reverend Martin learned that Mr. Denton's decision to do this was controversial at the time and is still considered countercultural. The principal was adamant on graduation day that everyone looks the same. It was the parents of the top achievers who initially didn't like it. In the eyes of the world through the thought Denton, a diploma is a diploma. The achievement was graduation itself, no matter how you'd gotten there, and that's what the principal wanted to communicate. So it is with the kingdom of God. Jesus says, God graciously in decision to include us in the kingdom doesn't operate on principles of capitalism or merit or any kind of do-goodery. Grace cannot be calculated or estimated. It definitely doesn't work when we try to compare ourselves with others. And if we start to think that anyone else is more or less worthy of it, God is moved towards those who feel undervalued, who haven't been chosen, who go through life wondering if they've got any worth at all. God wants people in the vineyard, in the kingdom of God. There are no ribbons or tassels, no sashes there, no signs that anyone is more special or treated, treasured, just that life of Jesus offered on the cross. And that is more generous than anyone saw coming, to which we're all eternally grateful. God wants everyone to have enough. There's an old Haitian proverb that says, God gives, but God doesn't share. The idea is that God has given enough enough food, enough water, enough of the basics of life, it's up to us to share instead of hoarding or blocking that sharing. At the end of the day, this really isn't about you or me or what time we show up for work, although no doubt that has its importance. This is really about day after day the goodness of God that keeps showing up in the morning, in the evening, all day long to lepers, to prostitutes, to prodigal children, to Samaritans to thieves on the cross, to outsiders, to you and to me. When we come and kneel at the altar, at the foot of the cross, each person, regardless of who they are and how useless they feel, everyone is of us is graciously called forth and given a purpose in God's life, in God's kingdom. I pray that together we can assure others that there is a way to fit into the glorious work of the body of Christ. As Paul says, that he as a church can strive together side by side with one another in one mind for the faith of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
injustices. We look around us and see mercy being offered to others when we feel that they have done little to merit such treatment. Our world is in such bad shape. There are true injustices and horrible situations in which peace and mercy seem to be dim and distant hopes. Give us eyes to see where justice and compassion may be offered. Give us hearts to reach out to those who are new in the faith, who are struggling in life. Enable us and strengthen us each to be in your service, that we may offer peace and hope to others, not counting the cost, but sharing your wealth of mercy and love. Your grace and mercy are abundant, whether we're lifelong laborers or new arrivals in your vineyard. We know you value us just as we are. Oh God, hear now the prayers of concerns which we name in our hearts before you now. So we pray for Michael. We pray for Heather and her family. We pray for Nadia. We pray for Janet. We pray for Joy. We pray for traveling mercies. We pray for Sparky. We pray for our country. We're in a difficult time and need your guidance, O oh God. Help us do your will on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for those who are affected by Hurricane Laura and Sally. We lift up the mission teams as they serve those in need. We pray for the wildfires in the West. We pray for those who have lost everything as they rebuild their lives. We pray for the firefighters who put themselves in harm's way to protect others. God, we lift up those unspoken prayers in our hearts to you. God of the last, God of the first, God of all those in between, hear these concerns as we seek your presence in our lives and in our world. We pray that your spirit may fall afresh on those that we hold in our hearts. May they know your loving touch and be made whole. We too are in need of your presence and your healing. Lay your healing hand upon our hearts and spirits. We place our lives and our trust in you, O God. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Empower us to be committed to your way of life, of love and grace, <coughs> mercy and peace. <coughs> Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Be with those vulnerable lives who are at higher risk as they worry and grieve. Defend them from illness and despair. Be with the families of those who have been infected and those who have died. May they know your peace. We ache for ourselves and our neighbors standing before an uncertain future. We pray that your love would be set fire across our nation. Strengthen and sustain us Protect the caregivers and doctors and nurses and medical professionals. Bless them as they offer compassionate care and show selfless courage in the face of risk. May they know your protection and peace. Give wisdom and persistence to those focused on a vaccine. We grieve lost jobs and struggling businesses. We pray that you would sustain them both in these strange times. Inspire our leaders to discern and choose wisely to align themselves with the common good. Heal us from our fears which prevent nation to working together, helping neighbor, help one another. Help us rise above minor inconveniences to love our neighbor. Even as we are asked to keep our distance from others, help us to find ways to reach out to those in need. Help us to be your body in Christ. 
We pray for teachers and students in school. We pray that proper social distancing and hygiene will keep them safe and protect them. Give school leadership the wisdom to make decisions that care for all people. We pray for those students who are doing school virtually from home. We pray that they would have the resources they need to do their work. We also pray that students would have respect and patience with the challenges rolling out before them with the teachers. Protect and give them your peace. Oh God, today, let us rise, we rise with a renewed commitment to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you. <clears throat> let our spirits be mindful of those in need and our voices responsive to the injustice in our midst. Help us to continue to stand for something larger than ourselves, your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> May we love all we encounter as we love you. May we grow in your ways as we follow Christ's example. And may we serve others as we strive to be your hands and feet in the world. Truly, you are the spark. You are the light of the world that burns within us. Use us to share your light with the world, to be a lighthouse on a hill. It's for the sake of your gospel message and your kingdom of many blessings that we pray. And now we are bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the bread.
receive this benediction. Go forth into God's world as God's own children. Let the love of Christ be reflected in your life and in your deeds. Stand firm in the spirit, strive side by side, and live in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Now go forth in the peace of Christ, loving God and serving your neighbor in all that you do. Amen.